The prodigal son is a story that most of us have heard before. It's familiar, but still powerful. It's simple, but remarkably convicting. It doesn't matter who we are or where we're from or even what age or what time or what year we live in, we all can kind of connect with the characters that we see in this parable in Luke 15. And it's a parable that begins all the way back in the very first verse of uh, Luke 15 when some sinners and some tax collectors are coming to go to Jesus. And, and, they're, and what's interesting about that is that Jesus doesn't seem to get away from them. He doesn't push them away. He doesn't run away from them. What's interesting to me is that he sits down and eats with them. Jesus welcomes them. And this is very confusing for the Jewish leaders. You see, the Jewish leaders believe that no self-respecting Jewish teacher would ever eat with a sinner. They would never spend time with a tax collector. And yet, that's exactly what Jesus is doing here in Luke 15. So they start to complain. The scribes and the Pharisees there in Luke chapter 15, they don't understand why Jesus does the the things that he does. You see, they thought themselves as perfect. They thought they had everything figured out, and what they didn't realize is they didn't understand how God viewed sinners. And so that led Jesus to tell this parable there in Luke uh, Luke chapter 15. And it's a parable that we all need to hear. The sinners needed to hear it. The tax collectors needed to hear it. The scribes needed to hear it. The Pharisees needed to hear it. We're 2,000 years later, and it's it's a parable that we need to hear today. More than anything, the parable that Jesus tells us here in Luke chapter 15 is a parable that gets at the very heart of the gospel story. Because it shows us how much the Father loves the lost and rejoices when they return to him. That's what Luke 15 is all about in a nutshell. In fact, Jesus begins there by starting with two kind of lead-off parables. The first is about this man who has a hundred sheep. And he looks out one day and he goes, wait a second, I only count 99. And he counts again and he counts again and there's still 99 sheep. So he goes into the highways and the byways. He goes into the hills and the hollers. He looks everywhere for that lost sheep. And finally, he finds it. And so he calls all of his friends together and says, friends, come join me. We're going to have a feast. We're going to have a celebration. We're going to have this party because I found my lost sheep. I had a hundred. One went missing. Now I have a hundred again. And Jesus concludes that parable there in verse 7 by saying these words. I tell you in the same way, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous people who don't need repentance. But Jesus isn't through and tells that second parable, that second part of the parable, there in the next couple of verses about this woman who had 10 coins. And this woman who had 10 coins looks out one day and she looks in her piggy bank and she only has nine coins and so she does some spring cleaning. She flips over her couches, she flips over her pillows, she flips over everything and finally finds that one missing coin. Calls all of her neighbors, calls her friends over and says, come, let's have a party, let's rejoice. Because that one lost coin, well, I found it. And Jesus concludes that second parable, that second part there in verse 10 by saying, I tell you in the same way. There is joy in the presence of God's angels over one sinner who repents. But the third parable comes along there in verse 10 and hits us like a two by four. Because that parable starts to get personal. It's about a father. And this father has two sons. The prodigal son and the bitter brother. 
But this parable is a pet parable that we'll find out teaches us about the father's love for both of his children, not just the prodigal who goes away, as we're going to find out, but also his love for that bitter brother, the one who stayed home. And so today, I just want to look at this parable together. Look at these three characters together and make some observations that I think will help us in our walk with Christ today. And as we walk through this fairly familiar parable, I want us to ask one question of ourselves. Who am I in this parable? You know, I think our answer to that question tells us a little bit about our heart. But I think our answer to this question is also convicting. It's also challenging. More than that, I think our answer to that question gives us a greater appreciation for our Father's love for us. Let's start by reading the first couple of verses of this parable there in Luke chapter 15, beginning in verse 11, where he, that's Jesus, also said, a man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the estate I have coming to me. So he distributed the assets to them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered together all that he had and traveled to a distant country where he squandered his estate in foolish living. And after he had spent everything, a severe famine struck that country, and he had nothing. Then when he went to work for one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his fields to feed pigs, and he longed to eat his fill from the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one would give him anything. This story in Luke 15 begins with this younger son going to his dad and said, I want my inheritance, I want my money, and I want my money now. And that's an interesting request on a lot of different levels because he's basically telling his dad, I wish you were dead. 2,000 years later, we look at that request. And there's a part of us probably that cringes. Because it's a horrendous request in every culture and in every age. No one wants their father to die. I mean, parents, you're sitting here today and you have your kids. What would you do if your son or your daughter came to you and said, Mom, Dad, give me my inheritance and I want it right now. How would you react? I think a lot of parents here today would go, no, over my dead body, I'm not giving you your money yet. But what's shocking, in this parable, the father does the unthinkable. He says, here you go, son, here's your, here's your money, here's your portion of the estate. And, and, and soon after, the, the, the younger son travels to a distant country, to a faraway land. He doesn't write home. He doesn't send any emails. He doesn't send any text messages. There's no Zoom calls. He lives how he wants to live, far away from his parents. In his mind, his father is dead. So he starts to squander his inheritance. In fact, that's why we call this first character that younger son, the prodigal son. Because he wastes his inheritance. That's what prodigal means. It means to waste. But things go from bad to worse, and suddenly he finds himself in the middle of a crisis. There's a famine in the land. And things are so bad that he starts to feed pigs. No Jewish person in the first century would ever lower themselves to feed pigs. Pigs are an unclean animal. This is the worst of the worst of the worst job you could ever have as a young Jewish boy. This is about as low as you can get. But it's the only way this younger son, this prodigal son, knows how to put food in his mouth and a roof over his head. And so he starts to feed pigs. And one day, he looks down at the food that he's feeding the pigs, and he goes, wow, 
that looks mighty tasty. Now we have some people who have raised farm animals before. Perhaps you raised pigs at one point. I have never raised pigs. I've had a couple of dogs. And I have never once in my life, with all the dogs that I've owned, looked down at my dog food and gone, I want to switch plates with my dog. But that's what the prodigal does. He looks down at the pig food and goes, I want to switch plates with you. That's about how low he has gone. You know, the thing about prodigals, like this rebellious son that we're looking at here in Luke 15, is they never think things will get this bad. They never think that things will get this wrong in their life. They never think they will end up alone and isolated and far away from family and friends. But that's what sin does. Sin will take us farther than we want to go, keep us longer than we want to stay, and cost us more than we are willing to pay. And that's what the prodigal son found out the hard way. And so this part of the parable becomes a warning to all of us today about the devastating effects of sin. That sin has consequences. And sometimes it takes hitting rock bottom, like the prodigal does, for us to realize how far we've fallen. Sometimes it takes losing everything. Sometimes we have to be broken. Sometimes we have to be broken by the devastating consequences of our sins before we are are ready to make a change. And that's what we see from this prodigal here in Luke chapter 15. There in verse 17, we see in verse 17, when he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired workers have more than enough food and I am dying of hunger? I'll get up. And go to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like your hired workers. There in verse 17, the prodigal, as he looks down and he's feeding the pigs and he sees the tasty pig food, he starts to come to his senses. He starts to realize the depth of his despair, the depth of his sin. And he makes the decision there in the text to go back home, to return to his father. But look at verse 19 one more time. Because I think verse 19 helps us understand what's going on in that, that prodigal son as he began to understand the devastating consequences of his sin. You see, in his mind in verse 19, the prodigal thinks he is worthless. The prodigal doesn't even want to be a a son anymore. He wants to be a hired worker. He's willing to do anything and everything to be close to that father one more time. And maybe we're here today and we're kind of connecting with that younger son. We're kind of connecting with that prodigal. We're doing our own thing in the distant country And it didn't work out for us. And we've hit rock bottom. And and we're wondering how the Father, how people will respond if we come back. Well, just look at this parable. Because, spoiler alert, the Father welcomes him back. He rejoices when his son comes back. Because that's what fathers do. Because fathers love their children. But that prodigal son isn't the only child. Just a few verses later, we're introduced to that older brother. And when that older brother, or the, the prodigal son, returns home, the older brother is still in the field. He's still working. He's still sweating. It's been a long day for him. And so later when he gets home and returns to the house and he hears the noise of the celebration, he asks one of the servants, what's going on? And the servant responds there in verse 27. He says, your brother is here, he told him. And your father has slaughtered the fatted calf because he took him back safe and sound. You know, one would think that the return of his long lost prodigal brother 
would be enough for this older brother to rejoice. The brother he grew up with, the brother he played ball with, the brother that he hung out with, the brother that he fought with, is probably back home. That he would be running into the house to hang out with his brother one more time, to hug his brother one more time. That he would be happy, he would be overflowing with joy. But not this brother. There in verse 28, it tells us that he, the older brother, became angry and didn't want to go in. So his father came out and pleaded with him. You see, in this older brother's mind, the prodigal has abandoned the family. He has wasted the inheritance. The prodigal had his shot. Why would they celebrate him? And he becomes just a little bitter. And that's why we call him the bitter brother. In fact, there in the text, he is so angry, so irate, that he doesn't even want to enter the house. He's not going to even go in the back door and run away to his bedroom. He won't even enter the house. He's not sharing his father's joy. And when his father comes out and pleads with him and begs with him, son, come in, join the celebration, eat yourself a slice of brisket, the son doesn't budge. There in verse 29, he he looks his father straight in the eye and says, look, I have been slaving many years for you. I have never disobeyed your orders. And you never gave me a goat, not a cow. You never gave me a goat that I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, you de- who, the son who, who devoured your assets with prostitutes, you slaughtered the fatted calf for him. We look at those verses the bitter brother's response there in 29 and 30, and we go, there's a lot to unpack here. Because the bitter brother is basically standing there telling his father, this is not fair. I have been the perfect son. I've done my job. I've always obeyed. I am the best son one could ever have. And what did I get for it? Nothing. I never had the chance to celebrate with my friends I never got a chance to party. Being perfect never paid off. And yet when this son, this disgraceful son, this prodigal son comes back, you roll out the red carpet and you treat him like a VIP. But do you notice anything about his response? That bitter brother's response? There's no heart There's no love. Being with his father every day was not a joy to him. He had somehow managed to get away from his father without ever leaving the farm. Just look how he described his relationship with his father there in the text. In verse 29, he he says, I have been slaving for you. Dad, working for you. Working in your fields and working with your animals has been like slavery to me. You have been a horrible taskmaster. He tells his father, Father, I have always obeyed your commands. Maybe your childhood was a little different than mine. But I can tell you this, I never obeyed all of my parents' commands. Maybe yours was different. But this prodigal looks his father straight in the eye and goes, Dad, I always obeyed you. And yet you never gave me a goat. He looks at his father, the father who gave him life, the father who probably put clothes on his back and food on his table and said, Dad, you're not a generous father. When we look at the older brother describe his relationship with his father, it's pretty clear to me at least that the bitter brother viewed that father as a Master to be obeyed, not a father to be loved. And we look at his response and go, how could he be so insensitive? How could he be so ungrateful? How could he be so bitter? How could he be so self-righteous? 
after all, the older brother thinks he's done everything wrong, right. And that younger brother, that prodigal brother over there has done everything wrong. But how many times in our life do we have that exact same attitude? When a brother or sister in Christ confesses a sin to us or before the assembly, how many times do we think in our hearts, I would never commit that sin. I'm a better Christian than they are. Or we look out and we see a brother or sister in Christ going through the devastating consequences of their sin in their life. And we look at them and think to ourselves, well, they got what they deserved. They had it coming. How many times do we think that in our hearts? Why do we have that attitude? Well, it's because it's so easy for us to be like the older brother. To be just like the Pharisees that Jesus is telling this parable to. To look at sinners and the tax collectors of our day and ask, why would God show his grace and his mercy and his love to them? And why do we have that attitude? Well, over time, I think we begin to see ourselves as basically good people who haven't done any really bad things. And all the while, that deadly sin of self-righteousness and pride and envy consumes our heart. All the while, our heart is rotten. Yes, outwardly we look righteous, but inwardly we're a mess. And the great irony of this parable that Jesus is telling here in Luke 15 is that those sinners and those tax collectors were closer to the Father than the scribes and the Pharisees. You see, the sinners and the tax collectors realized they were broken. The sinners and the tax collectors realized they needed Jesus in their life, but the scribes and the Pharisees didn't. They were still far away from the Father. And isn't that a warning for all of us? That sometimes, even in our very best efforts to avoid being that prodigal son, we become the bitter brother. We end up just like the Pharisees, that we don't serve our Father in heaven out of love, Reading our Bibles and coming to church and spending time with our brothers and sisters in Christ isn't a joy to us. It's not something that excites us. It's something that we dread. It's something that we view as work. And the great tragedy of this parable that we're looking at today is there are really two prodigal sons. There is the younger son, the one that we traditionally call the prodigal son who was given his inheritance, went away from his father and wasted his inheritance. He is the prodigal son. And he is the prodigal son because the, the, uh, the lust of the flesh pushed him farther away from the father. But there's also the bitter brother, that older brother, who may have lived in the house, may have been close to his father physically, but was actually far away from the father because of the pride of life. And still 2,000 years later, there are still two types of prodigals. There's the secular prodigal, and that's the prodigal that also comes to our mind. The one who perhaps was raised in the church, but decides at some point in their life they want to get nothing to do with Jesus. They want nothing to do with God. They never darken the door of a church building ever again. Having a relationship with Christ is not something that's important to them. That's the secular prodigal. But there's also the spiritual prodigal. And that's the prodigal son who goes to church, who sings the songs and prays the prayers and does all the right things. But his heart is still far from the father. So he's the spiritual prodigal. And how many of us fall into that second category? 
But the good news of this parable is that both sons, the older son and the younger son, the spiritual prodigal and the secular prodigal are both brought near by the father's love. You see, this parable in Luke 15 isn't really about the sons. It's about the father and the father's love for both sons. The father himself is mentioned like 25 or 26 times directly or indirectly in this parable. And so Jesus is trying to emphasize to the scribes and the Pharisees, the sinners and the tax collector, the mercy and grace and, yes, the love of the father. That the father's love here in Luke 15 moves him to go above and beyond to be reconciled to his sons. Jesus is trying to teach both audiences, both groups of people there in Luke 15, how much the father is willing to do to seek and save the lost. And so we can't read Luke 15 without coming away overwhelmed by the Father's love because he is in every way the loving Father. Just look at verse 20 one more time. There in the text it says, He got up, that's the prodigal, He got up and went to his father. And while the son was still a long way off, his father saw him. If we're sitting in the Father's shoes right now, what's our response? Resentment, perhaps. This son wish I was dead and now he's coming back around? Maybe we're a little resentful. Suspicion, perhaps. He's wasted his inheritance, he has nothing left. And now all he wants is a a place to sleep and a roof over his head and food on his table? Or maybe a little suspicion? Or what about love and mercy and forgiveness? Because that's what makes this father so remarkable. When he sees that son, the text tells us that he was filled with compassion. And so this father runs to his son. Jewish men were not in the habit of running. If you saw a Jewish man run, you need to be looking for a lion or tiger or bear. They were not in the habit of running. They didn't run 5Ks. But this father sees his son off in the distance. He's not waiting for that son to come in the front door. He runs to his son to welcome his son. And when he gets to his son, he threw his arms around his neck. He's not waiting for that son to make that first move. He hugs his son, he embraces his son, he welcomes his son back. And he is so moved with compassion that he starts to kiss his son. That's how this father welcomed this son home. How long had this father waited for this day? How many nights has he stayed up dreaming of the day when that son would return home? And family and friends of prodigals understand this better than anyone. How many nights do parents of prodigals stay up? Waiting by the phone call. Waiting for the call that says, Mom, Dad, I've messed up. I've sinned. I have messed up my life. And Mom, I need you. And I need you right now. How many times have friends of prodigal come to church? on a Sunday morning, hoping that this is the first time that our friend darkens the door of a church building in 10 years, 20 years? How many times do we stay up waiting, longing, praying for that prodigal to come back to the Lord? That's how this prodigal father feels. And when the son comes to him and says there in verse 21, Father, I have sinned against you. Against heaven and in your sight, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. When the father or the son confesses his sins to the father, look how the father reacts in verse 22. He tells his servants, quick, bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Then bring the fatted calf and slaughter it and let's celebrate with a feast. Because his son of mine was dead and is alive again. 
he was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. The prodigal doesn't waste any time. The father doesn't waste any time. He rejoices and he rejoices immediately. He forgives and he forgives immediately. And for me, my mind drifts to Psalm 103, where the writer describes this beautiful portrait of God's forgiveness there in Psalm 103, where he says these words, that he, that's God, has not dealt with us as our sins deserve or repaid us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his faithful love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, he has removed our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. You see, the beautiful thing about the father's love is that he does more than forgive his child. His love overflows in this incredible celebration. That's how our Father in heaven responds when a sinner returns to him. And so the challenge for us today as children of God is to have that same exact attitude, that same exact response when a sinner comes back to God. But the text also describes how the father showed his love for that other son. When that other son is skeptical, when he complains, that father goes out to him. He pleads with him. He calls him son. He reminds that older son. He says, I'm going to give everything to you. You see there in the text that, older, that father loved both sons. He loved that younger son who had turned away and moved to a distant country. But he loved that older son who had stayed close to home and had that hardened heart. And so as he begins to explain the father's love, he looks at the older son and and tells him there in verse 32, but we had to celebrate. He tells that old brother, we had to celebrate and rejoice because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and now is found. You see, the father teaches the older son a lesson about a father's love. That when a lost son returns, we must rejoice. And so the question that is before us this morning is who am I in this parable? Am I the prodigal son? Have I become the bitter brother? Or do I have the same love? the father has who am i who are you in this parable you see the great challenge of this parable here in luke 15 is for us as children of god who share the same joy the same forgiveness the same compassion that the father has toward both sons the older son who is bitter who has that hardened heart the son that sometimes let's just be honest we act just like but also toward the prodigal. And maybe we're here today, and we're the prodigal. That we've wandered away from God, we've rebelled against God, and the sin and the despair in our life has finally broken us. That we've hit rock bottom and we have nowhere else to turn. And so we're ready to come back to our Father. That's where you're at today. We'd love nothing more than to help you to rejoice with you as you are restored to your Father once again. If we can help you with that, please let us know while together we stand and sing.